So I'm just going to give a sort of a bit, bit of a brief overview of the, the area, the interface between mental health and nutrition, and then go into a little bit of detail about some specific studies. So just to give a disclaimer, I, will, I, I actually never talk in name formulas. Uh, they are listed in the book, all the different formulas that have been studied, uh, the ones in my lab, as well as ones overseas. Um, but I study the idea that nutrients is nutrition is relevant to the brain. And the only way you can really do that with double blind control trials is by doing it with capsules of minerals and vitamins. So that's what I've been doing over the last 15 years. But I certainly don't make any money out of it. And I don't receive any money or funding from the companies that make the products that I've been studying. And that's really important to have that um, arms that are arms length away from the people who make the products. And also a disclaimer that I'm going to talk about nutrition, but we know that if we could address poverty in our, in our society or that we could uh, reduce the amount of trauma that people are exposed to, then we would go a long way towards reducing the uh, number of people who are struggling with a mental health issue. So you probably don't need to be told about the scale of the problem. Here's the South Island where you guys are all sitting there. Um, and uh, the population of the South Island is about a million people. It's a fifth of the population. And that's the number of people who are struggling with a mental health issue in any one given year. We know the numbers are going up. This is just based on New Zealand data, New Zealand Health Survey. We see an increase in the number of people with a mood disorder from 2006 to 2018, an increase of 47%, an increase of 160% in the number of people who would meet criteria for an anxiety disorder. About 5% of the population are in the severe range, 9% moderate and 7% mild. But I would say there's a whole a host of more, a lot more people who are just struggling subclinically with a whole host of psychiatric or psychological symptoms. And then we look, we, we know that this has been, um, you know, addressed by giving medications. And if we look at the data on antidepressants, that's gone up by 48% over a decade. And the rise in the use of antipsychotics has gone up by 40% um, uh, over a decade, over two, from 2007 to 2016. So we're trying to address this problem with medications. Primarily, if you're lucky, you might get psychotherapy. But um, at the end of the day, I think it's fair to say that we have a problem of epidemic proportions, an increasing number of people being identified with a mental health problem. Conventional treatments are simply not helping and reaching enough people. And if they were, I think the rates should be going down. Certainly medications have saved lots of people's lives, but far too many people are still suffering. And those are the ones that I hear about. And you know, Grant mentioned my TEDx talk. One point, it's actually 1.8 million now. Um, and it's, uh, it, I get thousands of, of emails and, and calls over the years. And I'm, I can attest to you that there are people out there who are on multiple, many medications doing their best. Their doctors are doing their best. Um, and yet they are still struggling. And the report that went to the government two years ago, three years ago, we can't medicate or treat our way out of the epidemic of mental distress. So what else can we do? I think that we need to really, you know, as Grant already talked about his own personal story, we need to be looking at what we're putting in our mouths. And really, when it comes to the work that I do, I think about the brain, it's although it's only 2% of our body weight, it consumes 20 to 40% of the glucose and nutrients that come directly from our food. I like to call it the hungriest organ. And so we are, our education around food is often about muscles or heart or um, bones. We never never very, very rarely have been talking about the brain and the nutritional requirements of the brain. And I hope to convince you over the next 20 minutes or so uh, why you should care. So I like to call this the biggest social experiment of all time. We've been eating these foods for about 100 years, plus or minus, um, and we've seen an increase in the chronic diseases, diabetes, heart disease, uh, obesity, and mental health issues. It's not, this is, this is not a coincidence. There's some really robust data that show that this type of eating has been detrimental to our health. We've been changing the foods that we eat from whole foods to processed foods, which overall is not necessarily a bad thing. Processed could include canning foods or frozen, uh, freezing food, um, and that can retain the nutrient quality of that particular food, like your peas or your vegetables. Um, but really, the the biggest problem is the ultra processed food that people are being are consuming. You'd think that not you could 
argue that not a lot of us are consuming ultra processed food. Um, you just have to look at the data and say, see that 48% of the caloric intake of Canadians is uh, ultra processed, 61% of Americans, and 69% of packaged foods that are sold in supermarkets in New Zealand are considered ultra processed. So it's rampant, it's everywhere. And uh, most of many, half of the calories that people are consuming come from ultra processed food. I suspect perhaps less in this audience, given you're interested, but um, we need to really pay attention to this at a population level because it's killing us. Um, what happens when we eliminate half the nutrients in the diet, which is essentially what's happening when half of your caloric intake is coming from ultra processed food. We already know this from Ansel Keys in the 1950s, based on the starvation experiments, I certainly wouldn't rec recommend replicating this. Um, they took uh, what were considered 36 normal healthy men, um, and they were exposed to six months of nutrient deprivation. And they, they reduced it, their caloric intake by about 50%. And what they found was that these people experienced a lot of psychological symptoms, depression, hysteria, irritability, self-mutilation, apathy, lethargy, social withdrawal, and inability to concentrate. These are all symptoms that we're very familiar with. They're the ones that are often associated with psychological problems. So it's not a mystery that, uh, that food can seriously impact on our mental health. And yet my training in clinical psychology, and I suspect the training of any of my the medical colleagues in the audience would be that you weren't given a lot of uh, information about the importance of nutrition for the brain. It was viewed as irrelevant to uh, psychological problems when I was training, and it still is really not talked a lot about. It certainly it is increasing in our clinical psychology program at Canterbury, but it's not something that we seem to be get, edu get educated about. And that means that we don't share that information with our patients and therefore they won't be um, exposed to this and the enormous amount of research that's being done in this area. So one obvious solution though, is that we should just tell everyone to eat better. And what does that mean? I think we can, uh, there's a lot of debate around that. But what I can share with you is the epidemiological studies that have been done around the world in Australia and Spain and the UK, in Japan, and they're all uh, sort of showing this a whole food diet. And it's, it's, it is difficult to sort of quantify and say what a dietary pattern looks like. But when they, they sort of identify that people who are following a whole food often a Mediterranean style diet, but not always, sometimes it's a local to their, their area, is that when you're eating foods that are high in fruits and vegetables, your fish, your healthy fats, uh, low in your takeaways, then that's, that is associated with a reduction of mental health, illness, depression, and anxiety. And the more we consume foods that are consistent with a Western type of diet, the greater our risk for mental health issues. And this is not just based on cross-sectional data where you might indicate or think that people who are depressed, naturally, they're going to eat more poorly. It's also based on longitudinal data where they follow people over time and they look at their diet over time and they look at their psychological symptoms over time and they find that what you're eating at time one uh, uh, predicts your mental health at time two. And those are up to five, those studies are up to five years. So it's certainly a risk factor. It's not everything. It doesn't explain all mental health issues, but it certainly seems to be a pretty robust one that we need to pay attention to. So what does it mean to eat better? Um, when the public thinks about the content of food, what do you think they think about? So I've spent a lot of time thinking about food labels and to try to better understand the messages that are coming out from the, when you know, when you're walking around the supermarket, what are we being told by the food industry? And I've come to the conclusion that, uh, that we focus the most on the macronutrients and that's your carbs, your proteins, and your fats. And if you look at any food label, uh, you'll see that they'll tell you about your saturated fat content, your calorie content, it'll tell you about your carb content of that specific type of food. Uh, but what's, what is completely almost missing, not entirely, but virtually missing is the micronutrient content of that food. But you might think about calories, and we've spent uh, you know decades counting calories uh, to no avail. We've just gotten fatter, so that's clearly not the way forward. Um, and if you think about it from just a calorie perspective, the Big Mac is going to be the same calorie uh, qu uh, quantity as a falafel salad. 
and hopefully we all know that the falafel salad is going to be better for us um, nutritionally. But if you're someone who's, you know, being told about just ca- uh, counting your calories and making sure you hit about that 2000, 2500 calories per day, then you might make different choices. So here's some of those food labels um, and looking at the nutritional facts, you can see that the information that they're shared with the most is about these calories and these macronutrients. Sometimes you might see a few micronutrients mentioned there and you'll see that the one, you know, these ones that I've found on food packages have very few micronutrients. So vitamin D in this one has got, there's no vitamin D. I don't know why they bother listing that or calcium 2%. So you, um, you know, the, the, you're not getting a lot of information, even something that's rich in micronutrients, they won't tell you on the package because that's not what's required for packaging. So you, even something like if you happen to have a package for something that was healthier, maybe some nuts, you still won't learn how much there is there in there in terms of micronutrient content, like your selenium or your magnesium. It's just simply not there. Uh, we've developed in New Zealand uh, this traffic light system. I hate them for the most part. Uh, sorry to those who uh, you think these have been really wonderful. I think it, uh, for the most part, they help you choose a better ultra processed food over another one. That's not entirely true because there are some really healthy options that have got these health star ratings. Often they do more poorly than the really ultra processed food. That's because of the focus of the healthy star ratings. It's on energies. If you're low in energy, low in calories, low in saturated fats, low in sugar, low in sodium, and you have one nutrient, then you're going to get five stars. So if it was fortified with iron, it would get five stars if it was low on those other things. And I I, I like to say is that a cardboard box would get four star rating, but that doesn't mean you should eat it. It is a real concern that things that like a cardboard box or anything inanimate would get such a high star rating. Because, and that's based on the fact that it's about what's not in the food rather than what is in the food. And so I think we really need to be focusing more on what's in your food rather than, um, you know, what's not in it. So uh, many people won't tell you uh, or think about, therefore, about the micronutrient adequacy of food. And there's nothing in the food labels that are going to tell you about whether or not it's good for your brain. So I want to switch to the micro thinking about micronutrients. This is the cover of my book, The Better Brain. Um, And what are they? They're vitamins and minerals. Uh, They're required in small amounts for the most part, although there are some macronutrients that macro minerals, sorry, like calcium, because we take we consume that in a much higher quantity dose relative to other um, other other micronutrients, um, like say you take a very small dose of um, say B12, for example essential for production of enzymes, hormones, neurotransmitters. And why do we need them? They're the building blocks of our brain. Our mitochondria need them for, um, for energy production. If you look at the Krebs cycle, every along all the pathways for making all of those chemicals that eventually will produce ATP, you need micronutrients. They're identified as cofactors all the way along. And it's not one special micronutrient, it's the full array. When we think about the manufacture of neurotransmitters, I'll show you slides soon. But we, we um, need to understand that to make serotonin or dopamine, all these really important uh, neurotransmitters are important for emotion regulation or for concentration. You need micronutrients in order to manufacture them. And we're, for regulation of DNA and keeping our DNA healthy, we need micronutrients. Also, other things that are important that they do is, you know, eliminating toxins. That if you got exposed to a lot of toxins in our environment, like your plastics or your um, uh, other toxins, you need the, the, the detoxification pathway requires nutrients. So just looking at brain metabolism specifically, uh, the transformation of one compound to another chemical, A to chemical B, you need an enzyme and you need cofactors. And so that could be tryptophan to serotonin. Um, You'll have an enzyme that's important for that, but you'd need those cofactors and no special nutrient. That's really, really important. We, We are so focused on just that magic bullet, you know, that just take more vitamin D and you'll feel better or just take zinc. I think that's, you know, when you think about brain metabolism, you recognize really quickly that that's the wrong way to think about it. So if we look at the pathways, a small portion of pathways, of the pathways to make serotonin, you can see that there's a whole host of different nutrients that are required. And then I ask you whether or not we can get those nutrients out of ultra processed food. And hopefully, you know, the answer to that. 
So nutrient density and variety of food is going to be essential. There's uh, now research that's been done where people have been, uh, uh, where they've been enrolled in research where they get uh, randomized to either a Mediterranean style diet versus a control group, which has been social support. And the Mediterranean style diet um, does consist of a little bit of meat in there and a little bit of, of certainly some portions of fish, uh, but mostly it's a lot, it's high in your legumes, your fruits and vegetables. Um, and what they found was that there was far greater reduction of the number of people who were struggling with a major depression. They had to be depressed to get into the study. They had to have a poor diet to get into the study. And um, they showed a very large group, different effect size of 1.16. Um, number needed to treat for remission was 4.1. And here's just the data looking at the reduction in the their depression scores in the diet intervention versus social support. 32% of them, those on the diet intervention went into remission in their depression compared to 8% in the control group. The, the great thing about this study is that it has now been replicated twice in other centers in Australia. And so we can feel pretty confident that, that a change in your diet can have a very, very positive effect on your mental health, health status. And there's just the what they were using in that study in terms of the, the um, recommendations, what they were trying to increase uh, the consumption of in these people, um, specifically the, you know, the olive oils, the grains, the dairy, um, nuts, increasing the, your legumes. As I said, there's a, there was a little bit of red meat, um, some servings of fish, poultry, eggs and a little bit of, of opportunity for some extras, you know, some, some dark chocolate, those types of things. So most of the data when it comes to mental health, and I really want to emphasize that I'm not talking about physical health here has been around the Mediterranean diet. And that does seem to be a really good recommendation um, for people who are struggling with mental health issues is to first look at in reducing their consumption of ultra processed food and increase their consumption of whole real food. Um, but even if we do get the manage to get the public to eat more nutrient dense food, is that enough? And so there's some reasons why I think we need to be concerned about our food supply. Uh, we choose uh, foods that are rich in, you know, that are that grow quickly, that um, transport well, um, that don't bruise, that look pretty, but we're not choosing foods necessarily for their nutrient content. And we have, there's a lot of data um, across the world that's suggesting that the nutrient density of our food has been decreasing. That might partly be because as well of the poor remineralization of our soils. We know that there are specific nutrients that are depleted in soils in New Zealand, like iodine and selenium, but we also only seem to put back um, P, K and N back into the soil. And so some, you know, more or, uh, local, you know, the local farmers may be doing more in terms of repleting other trace minerals. We're putting glyphosate um, on our crops and that is a, can be considered a mineral chelator, which has, has been shown to reduce um, the nutrient density of our food. And with the increase in carbon dioxide in the planet, that actually also has a detrimental negative side effect of um, plants growing more quickly, which I guess is a good thing. But the downside of that is that the plant then doesn't have the sufficient amount of time to take the minerals up through in the soil into the plant. And so they can um, be deprived of the full array of nutrients. And um, these are some data from uh, Canada looking at the number of uh, 40 different fields um, in Canada, where they looked at the nutrient uh, density of nutrient quality of the soils. And this is the percentage of those fields in which the nutrient was above the lowest level of the ideal range. And so what you can see here is that magnesium is the only one that seems to be um, sufficient across all of those fields. And you can see that there's huge deficiency in many of the fields and things like manganese and copper zinc, boron, etc. So we do need to be concerned about this problem of the nutrient uh, quality of our soils. Um, so under what conditions might you need more nutrients than what you can get out of your food? So eating for food first is my message. Um, changing from that ultra processed diet to eating more of your whole real foods. Um, but for some people, that's not sufficient who are really struggling with some serious mental health issues. And that could be because of genetic differences that some people are simply more vulnerable. They don't, they're, they're, 
they don't code as well for certain enzymes that are important for, say, your methylation cycle or the Krebs cycle, and that that will influence that those the metabolic processes and will slow them down um, and make them more sluggish. As we age, unfortunately, we need our we're we're less able to absorb the nutrients that we do get out of our food. Medications that we all, that people take, like statins or antidepressants, have been shown to uh, have a, an effect on nutrients in terms of nutrient depletion. Inflammation can have a huge effect on our nutrient supply. Um, I can't see that one because of my pictures in the way. Sorry. Oh, yes, pregnancy. Um, uh, there are certain stages of life where we meet are obviously our nutritional needs are much higher pregnancy. I would also say adolescence. I have two of them. And I always like to think about it as brain is under reconstruction and that they need a lot more nutrients as they grow and the frontal lobes are developing. I've already talked about the exposure to toxins. Our gut health is really key uh, in terms of it's, it, it can, it will influence how much we absorb if we've got a really unhealthy inflamed gut. And then finally, I want to focus on stress because I suspect many of us are experiencing this and I do have some specific data that I want to talk about. You know, in terms of stress, do any of these things apply, you know, financial stress or overload at work or your, your family, medical issues, um, stressing you out, climate change, the effect of that, of just that worry about what's happening in the future, you know, traffic woes. Um, and then the coronavirus, you know, that has really had a huge impact on people's stress. And what's been interesting about coming to the UK for the last two years is, is that it is complete, it is constantly on my mind. And what I think that people have had to experience in places like this is that constant vigilance. And that for me is very similar to the constant vigilance that we all experienced in Christchurch after the following the Christchurch earthquakes. So I think there's some relevance there. And also that would mean that there may be some relevance on the research that I conducted um, in Christchurch that I'll share with you. So all of these factors could result in fewer nutrients being available for brain health. So to talk about some specific data here is that um, the there's there's uh, there's a wealth of data that a lot of people aren't familiar with showing that B vitamins specifically supplementing with B vitamins is helpful for, for reduction of stress. This has been done mostly in the workplace or with students, but they're placebo controlled trials. It's generally it's a small effect, um, but then these people aren't super super stressed. They're not uh, they're not clinically stressed. They're just feeling a little bit more anxious because of what's going on in their environment. When you couple the not that knowledge with the fact that when you are under, you're, you're exposed to a natural disaster like an earthquake, we make very poor food choices. And so that led me to think that we should be supplementing with micronutrients following a major stressor could be beneficial. So you'll all remember um, the Christchurch earthquakes of 2010, 2011. There was then another um, environmental disaster that I've studied, which was um, following an, a flood in uh, Calgary, Alberta in 2013. And then of course, our the devastation of March 15th, 2019, uh, when a gunman came and killed 51 people and injured 40 others in two mosques in Christchurch. So uh, what we did, what I've, I've done here is I've just compiled those some, some information that we got from those three events and some data. For the third one, it was, uh, we didn't do any research with the mosque victims in that I'm a white woman not connected with the Muslim community. It was not appropriate for me to uh, do any research then, but we uh, did some clinical observations where we uh, raised money and we donated uh, nutrients to anybody who was interested in taking them and we monitored them clinically over time. So I'm just going to share these data with you. So what I've, I've shown you here on is that is, that, is looking at the, this in respect to moderate, moderate stress, like how stressed people were when they were first uh, before before they started taking micronutrients um, in pill form, and we're looking at stress, and I'm just going to go through different stu um, studies with you. So this is the earthquake, and we were able to reduce, based on people taking broad spectrum micronutrients, reduce their stress from the moderate range on average to the normal stress range, so they were no longer clinically elevated. This is following that flood where we showed exactly the same thing, that's a beautiful replication. 
here's the, the clinical observation following the, the mosque shooting. And just know that I did everything I could have to get these funded uh, through the public health care system. I sent data um, to uh, the GP, local GPs, to, to uh, the mayor, to the, uh, you know, to um, uh, the science advisors, uh, the minister of health. It wasn't that I was silent about this, but we just couldn't get them to consider this as an option. And instead, um, I'll, sh I'll share what happened to them. Uh, so at Earthquake Comparator, we had people who chose not to take micronutrients. So you, it's not just this feel good effect of being in a clinical trial. We monitored these people and there was no change in their symptoms. And in the flood, we had a vitamin D comparator where they stayed um, still in the clinically elevated range. Um, there's that the, re the line indicating that. So we have three replications. Um, and in terms of number of people who said they felt a lot better, like much to very much improved, um, this shows you that the broad spectrum, the vitamins and minerals in combination are, are better than B-complex, which was our, our comparator, which I remember has been shown to be better than placebo. And that about 40% of them saw themselves as much to very much improved compared to 20% of them B-complex and 10% of those who are treatment as usual. Um, in the flood study, it was up to 50% of those broad spectrum, 40% B-complex, and uh, just under 20% for vitamin D alone. And then we have this uh, just looked at broad spectrum in the following the massacre, and you see a really high percentage, over 50% of those um, were reporting to be much to very much improved. So really simple uh, tr uh, treatment that has broad reach. And um, in terms of trauma, we looked at uh, probable PTSD and that reduced from 65% down to 19% uh, with those who were given the micronutrients in the earthquake. The, our treatment as usual, there was no change. You can see that it stayed about 48%. And then with the MOSS shooting, we also had that massive reduction relative to the earthquake. So 77% down to about 23%. So trauma rates of uh, symptoms associated with PTSD also decreased over a short period of time. And here's just one person who spoke to the press about his experience. Um, Mir Weiss Waziri. I started taking them at nutrients about two months after the attack. After a week, I was sleeping for six to, or seven hours a night. My appetite came back. I was happier and much more energetic. And I'm still not 100%, but I am much better than I was before. And as I said in my TEDx talk, and this was seven years ago, a well-nourished body and brain is better able to withstand ongoing stress and recover from mental illness giving micronutrients and appropriate doses can be an effective and inexpensive public health intervention to improve the mental health of a population following an environmental catastrophe. So I just wonder whether or not our resilience is lower due to our poor nutrient intake. So a better future I, I see for mental health is that we really address the dietary issues. It's just a, the elephant in the room. We need to be just, a, if I could have a magic wand and the number one thing that I would ask for is that we just get rid of ultra processed food from our supermarkets, from uh, the schools, so that our children are just simply not given that as a choice because it's not a food choice. It's, uh, it's nutrient depleted. Uh, that we obviously need to do, do other things like teach our children how to cook and exercise and be socially connected and then consider micronutrient supplementation when these other interventions don't work. Um, randomized trials in the 1600s showed that putting limes aboard ships um, headed out for long voyages completely eliminated the 40% mortality from scurvy. So there's the better brain. Um, it's out now. I was hoping to, uh, you know, if the people wanted to get signed copies that I would do that. Um, there's also an online course for people who want to know more about this research and the, the interface between mental health and nutrition is a MOOC, a mass online open access course. If you want to know about the nutrients we've studied, then email my lab, mentalhealthnutrition at canterbury.ac.nz. And then thanks to all the funders. Can you just tell, tell us what micronutrients in vegetables and fruits, or what fruits and vegetables would help our micronutrients the most? Yes. Okay. So um, I, I had this wonderful slide that I, I took out because I was I felt I was overdoing it. I um, and I, I did. I went over anyway. But it's it shows the micronutrient content of fruits and vegetables compared to ultra processed food. I, there's no one like it's not like there's a super vegetable out there. I mean, I know that if you look at something like kale or you look at lentils, they're really elevated in your nutrient content across the, the there's about 30 
vitamins and minerals that you should be we should be consuming as essential. But there isn't that one magic fruit or, fruit or vegetable that is going to have the full array of those nutrients. That if you just ate that, then you're going to be fine. You need to get the full array. I hope that answers the question. That's an excellent answer, and that's an answer that we would totally agree with as well. So well done. Uh, thank you very much. We need to move on. So have a good sure. day or morning, I suppose yes. you are in Britain. And again, thank you very much for speaking to us. And um, we'll say goodbye. So goodbye. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.